What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Blue Collar Boardroom. I've got an exciting guest. Hey, if the conversation is good on this podcast is the one that we've been having for the last two days, these guys are in for something special. I'm with a friend of mine, Taylor McCarthy. First saw him on an interview with Grant Cardone, a Power Players interview. He was one of the young guns, and I was like, man, if this guy's up there in this spot, I want to be there. Um, he was the number one door-to-door -door sales rep in the country at the age of 18 years old, in charge out of, uh, of 2,300 reps. And in the alarm industry, uh, for three years in a row, sold 380 plus to 400 accounts. Um, you know, what I really saw early on was when you were leading teams at Solar City and you uh, evolved and went into uh, like 700 different sales teams and I was seeing these huge sales meetings. And so, um, man, I'm honored to have you here, bro, because we got some important stuff to talk about, my man. Welcome to the Blue Collar Boardroom. Hey, thanks, Lee. I'm happy to be here. Um, so our mission is to raise the status of the blue collar entrepreneur. The door to door industry falls into that place. So you told me a little bit about your background. Um, do you identify with being like blue collar working class? Where's where, what kind of background do you come from? Yeah, it's it's funny. It's funny you say that because it brings me back. Right. It brings me back to humble beginnings. You know, I go way back when, you know, I'm going to get real, real with everybody. This is this, that's the type of person I am. But. Um, I watched my parents fight and get divorced at a young age. I saw my parents struggle with money and live week to week. And for some reason, at 12 or 13 or 14 years old, uh, I realized that the decisions that I make in my life were going to decide my wealth. And watching my parents struggle, I had said, hey, you know, the most successful people are willing to do things unsuccessful people are not willing to do. And at that time, I had made a decision uh, that I was going to do everything in my power to be able to get myself out of that position that I watched my parents get in. So my parents got divorced. I went with my dad. I watched my dad get screwed out of pretty much all the money. And he had maybe 40 or $50 left at the end of his paycheck every week. And those 40 or $50 he would spend on me and my little sister. Um, we lived in like a one, two bedroom apartment. And uh, I remember eating like SpaghettiOs, beefaroni. I'm not saying it's like the hardest life in the world. I know people have had it harder, but no, at it's, that it's time, tougher than I had it. At, at that time, I I had realized that you know I had to make certain decisions young in my life to get where I wanted to be because I realized at that age that I didn't want to be put into that position. I don't want my future family to be put in that position, and that was very important to me early in my life. Yeah, I mean, like, so, like, for me, at 18 years old, like, I remember it was, like, a month after I had turned 18 years old, so I'm, like, fresh, I'm legal. At 17, you can't sell door-to-door, -door. and before that, I was a golf caddy, and at 18 years old, you know, understanding I always worked off 100% commission as a golf caddy, uh, I used to have to carry a golf bag, two golf bags, one on each shoulder for one full round, and that usually took almost five hours. And at the end of the round, I would get $80 in commission. And at that time, it was great. I was making 20, 18 bucks an hour as a 14-year-old, as a 15-year-old, as a 16-year-old. And then I used to, I, me and uh, one of my best friends, actually, we were the two only caddies at one of the most prestigious golf courses in Massachusetts to ever complete double doubles. So we'd carry two golf bags on our shoulders for four or five hours. We would come back in, and then there would be more golfers going out that needed caddies. So we're like, all right, we'd get, we'd be the first caddies out, so we would have a second job. So picture, you're 10 hours with two golf bags on each shoulder. You made $160 for the day on a Saturday as a 14, 15 year old, and you think that's unbelievable. And I skipped the last class of, in high school, I actually had a 1.8 GPA. You need a 2.0 to actually qualify to go to state college which I didn't, I, I didn't qualify for state college. I had 1.8. And that last class was something like, we had four classes in a day, and the fourth class started at around 12. So I'd get out of my third class. I'd look both ways, make sure no teachers were looking. I'd run out the emergency exit, run over to my car. It's kind of like you, you get suspended for skipping school or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, I somehow managed a way to get myself out of that, you know, whatever way it was. I'd be in the field. I would w work at that time I was selling telecom for $86 a sale. Mm -hmm. So within my first, you know, I remember my first couple days, like within the first hour, I had three of them. So I'm like, I just made 240 bucks an hour when 
I was making 160 in 10 hours carrying golf bags around. So I'm like, okay, now I can understand that I can start using and start building myself to the point where I can get to that next level. And I used to skip my last class. I used to always tie myself. I'd say, hey, I need to make 86 before the school day ends. And I'd get my 86 and I'd stay out there the entire day. And I used to always tell myself, I'm working for $1,000 every single day. That's what I'm worth. And uh, I put myself in the field every single day, consistency. And uh, I think that work ethic and those early decisions, you know, when I was a caddy and watching my parents struggle, one of my favorite lines is, starting from the bottom is not a deficit, it's a gift. Absolutely. And I wish I had a little bit of that grit because I experienced that after I kind of went off on my own. And I remember failing out of college and coming back to my hometown and like my dad being like, dude, if you want to get back in the business, then you better get your shit together. Hmm. And so I started from scratch uh, a couple times in my life. But hearing that grit coming up, you know, I know those were some important lessons. Um, you know, growing up, though, one of the things that you know, I've always loved is to compete. And, and you, you've been bred in this culture and you, 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 to become arguably the greatest alarm and solar salesman of all time, you've been around some great salesmen, huh? Who, some, who, name some of the great people that you've learned from. I mean, there's a ton of them out there. Uh, you know, first off, my brother, Nathan McCarthy. Yeah. Kids, unbelievable at sales. Mm -hmm. uh, Timothy Yesta. Uh, guy down in Florida, Neil Rogers, uh, Hayes Barnard, uh, John Frampton, Jesse Folsom. Oh, I meant that John Frampton, dude. He's a beast. Yeah, these guys are all beasts and, and individually in what they do. And it's kind of like the way I look at it is there's a ton of great. To call yourself the greatest of all time is tough because you might be the greatest of all time at one certain aspect of door-to-door of, of -door sales. And I know my role, and I think that's very important for a lot of direct salespeople to understand. And I think that if what you... What is your role? Well, I think, I think my role is... Uh, my, my stuff's raw. My stuff's raw. Like, I'm going to the door, and I'm hitting people with stuff they never know. I'm going into trainings, and they never heard this stuff before. It's because my stuff is very original. So it's not just say, hey, I read this in a book, and I'm going to go teach it to you. Or, hey, I heard this in a training, I'm going to go teach it to you. So, like, I'll hear other professionals. And, like, for some person to say they're the GOAT, oh, I'm the GOAT, the GOAT doesn't call themselves the GOAT. It's not how it works. To call yourself the GOAT, is, it just doesn't work that way. You, you, you recognize there's greatness and all. Like, there's a ton of things in direct sales and door-to-door -door sales at that some of my mentors and a lot of the people I've trained at are so much better than me at. But I think what comes to me, where it comes to me is just that raw door-to-door, -door. like, when I got into direct sales, losing was never an option. Like, I didn't come into this to be second place. Like, there was an absolute certainty that I had when I started that there was no chance. And, like, the trophies prove it. Like, and when I was 18 at uh, a company called 2020, there was 2,300 sales reps, and I had made the decision that I was going to get to the top. And I, I made that, you know, non-negotiable. That was non-negotiable. So your buddy came to us to dinner the other night, and I want to tell the viewers the story. Uh, there was a contest. You uh, had lost the year before. Um, this week, you'd sold close to 50 alarms in one week. And, you know, basically he talked about you working all day without eating. You were just having this insane drive, just knocking more doors, yeah. talking to more people, staying in the field, staying focused. Mm -hmm. And, you know, People that watch this might think about building a sales team, but how they can imagine having a guy working on commission that won't eat because he's so sold for selling for his company. Yeah. How did that happen? What was what happened? It's the pain of loss, right? Yeah, the pain of loss. Like I, I, I've won some, I've lost some, but I'm still undefeated. That was a competition that I had absolute certainty that I was winning. I was not losing it. This was not a single competition, though. If it was a single competition and it was just me versus one other person, there's no problem with that. Let's go backwards. Because if, was, you're, if you're in contracting and you're watching this, they have a, 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 a tournament bracket way that they yes. can, can and explain to these guys how this contest So this work. specific competition, there was a qualifying for it where they had like four weeks of qualifying and then the top eight salesmen on your team would be considered the all-star team. And these 
eight individuals were seated, mm-hmm. and there was 16 teams in the bracket. So if you were one of the top 16, you'd make it into the bracket. At that time, I think we were maybe the third or fourth seed, somewhere in that range. So picture it's me and seven of my best friends. This isn't like, hey, these guys work for me. Like it's not it, they. It's my friendship and the way that I choose to lead is to say, hey, it's my it's my job to get out in front and lead the pack. But deep down, like these were the guys. Like I, I love these guys, right? So we're in this competition, same type of competition. And uh, the previous year, I had had my best week where I'd sold 31. And to do 20 in alarms in a week is, I'd say, less than 5% of people, not even. To consistently sell 20 a week, it's, it's relatively unheard of. So I had sold 31 the week before, and I had almost 50% better than most of the best production. And we had got to the last day of the competition, and we were up. It was so close, but we were up, and we were in Michigan. They were in California, so they had the time zone difference on us. And, you know, it came to 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. They're putting in sales. We're putting in sales. And we're like, okay, well, what do we do? It's 12 o'clock. And they step, kept putting on sales because it's 10 o'clock. And we're like, we're going to lose this competition. we got to do something. So five of us hopped in the car. We went to a mobile home community, mobile uh, manufactured home community, uh, a little bit of low income next to it. And I just said, hey, guys, look for lights on and <laughs> Get yourself in front of anyone and say, hey, it is serious. We're not trying to come down on anybody. However, it is important. That's one way to break preoccupation, right? I'm there for a reason. This is important. It's 2 a.m. in the morning right now, right? <laughs> I got a sale at 3.30. No. I, I'm pretty so sure. So what did they I, say when they came to the door? So I remember that, that specific porch? one. It was <laughs> That's um, what I'd tell you. somebody was sleeping, She like <laughs> half asleep. We're like, hey, I don't know about if you knew about the incident that happened. It is serious. We're trying to get everybody to understand this before everyone knows about all the incidents that were going on. And deep down, it's peace of mind for people. It's like, so in sales, it's never okay to be, it's never good to be pushy with people unless it's a life or death situation. So my mindset is this is a life or death situation. What happens if I don't protect this lady's family and four nights later she has a random home invasion? Mm, right? Terrible, man. You gotta take it on and cost. Gotta yeah, be an evangelist. So, so you gotta genuinely try to help people. Yeah. Bottom line, we came to the end of the competition. We won by we lost by one. We lost by one or two sales at the end of the night. It was it was devastating because we were so close mm-hmm. and we had, you know, had the absolute certainty and we worked so hard to win this competition and we lost. We lost on the last day by well, one. I would say that you're a better door-to-door salesperson than me because I was not raised around all those door-to-door greats. And whenever you have that type of level of competition, you know, basically, you know, in Carnegie Steel, they had a problem with a production plant and he started putting the number of units at that plant produced that day and then the next day the night shift produced more and then the day shift produced more i mean when you have a group <laughs> collaborating it just creates pressure pressure makes diamonds you rise to the top of those those, of those mountains now in roofing you know there was some greats that i learned from as well but you know we're, we're building jobs we're actually dealing with insurance companies and you ask me why don't we have thousands of sales reps and it's because you know we've been so kind of stuck in the old way and I, and that's what i really want everybody to pay attention to is there's a movement of transparency there's a revolution where the people are getting more power the information the tools and if you're in direct sales and you're only selling one product you're missing out on a lot of opportunity i mean heck we were out and we saw somebody do a stucco door-to-door sell in two minutes i'd never even seen the pitch before well, what was that I mean, there's so many ways in direct sales to make money. Why is door-to-door still relevant over, say, digital marketing? I think door-to-door is relevant because it's it's a it's a it's an emotion, right? It's an emotion. It's emotion. I'm transferring emotion um, from myself and my product to you, and I'm I'm servicing you in a in a way way more than you expect. I heard Jeff Mendez on a piece of content say that a sale is confidence, but it's transferred. And once Mm -hmm. the confidence is transferred from you to me, then, you know, that's when the sale is made. It's confident and it's knowing everything like the back of your hand. 
if you're not an expert, right? So I, I could be very logical with somebody. I could be like, hey, this is why it makes sense. But that has nothing. That's not going to get them to the finish line. What's going to get them to the finish line is my conviction. So if I go through this process with you, you'll do it. So I want to hear a little bit more about your journey because you you have told me so, that yeah. you, you, so, you earned 500000 a year for a while. Then you got to a point as a door salesman that you consistently earning over $800,000 a year. And you were in charge of 700 sales guys. Now, how old are you? I just turned 30. So you're, you're in your 20s making this money. Mm -hmm. uh, so talk to me about how you started going from best salesman to leading sales teams and, and how that started to transition. Yeah, so it's kind of like the analogy that I'll put is kind of like going from a Jerry Rice to a Jerry Jones. You know, when I was when I was selling alarm systems, I was still managing a team. But my number one focus was to be the number one sales, to be the number one sales rep. Bottom line, not, second wasn't an option. There's three straight years that I spent in the alarm industry, and uh, every year I had got the salesman of the year trophy. And then I got to the solar industry because I said, hey, you know, I've been traveling six months at a time, living out of my suitcase, four or five months here, four or five months there. And I said to myself, I want a vehicle and I want to be able to build something from where I'm from. I want to leave something. I want to have a lasting impression. And that was the reason that I had moved back with four of my friends, four of the guys that I'd worked with. There was five of us to start. And we had organically built that thing. You know, we had organically built that thing. We realized Solar City as a vehicle as a vehicle would help us build that. So it was easy selling when they knew who they were and they knew the story of the connection to the Musk family and stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, we had shirts that said, I work for Elon Musk. And now, he was the chairman of Solar City at the time, which was acquired by Tesla, but his cousins, Lyndon and Peter Rive, was, were the owners and CEO of the company and guys that we would actually communicate with. So it's like when you have you know, high-level leadership from – Elon Musk's cousins, and then you learn how to go from... Did you learn anything about uh, running a company from those guys? Yeah, I mean, because as an entrepreneur, you, you know, within that company, you're running your own company within the company. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the time you put into your so sales... So you were responsible team, for all the sales reps? So yeah, at that time, I was the director of sales, and I had helped organically build all, mostly all the teams on the East Coast. Um, I had a partner in this, a uh, very good friend of mine, Jesse Folsom, mm -hmm. and uh, he was, he really, like, this guy really helped, like, kind of get the best out of me. So, like, my role and where I focused on was the recruiting. Like, I brought, I brought all the guys, and then I brought the leaders, developed them, not only through my personal sales at the beginning of Solar City, but also by actually showing them and then... Uh, you know, making them feel much better about themselves. So getting the most out of the sales reps, uh, instilling the confidence in them, teaching them all the different ways to get to that. So it's like, it's hard to learn how to well, make a lot. How did you do that for 700 people? Because you said you did it all yeah. through WhatsApp, which is incredible. Because I mean, I use GroupMe and you know, using technology to communicate and lead teams, I can usually tell the culture of a, of a company and how well they're selling based off of their group chat. Yep. Um, you know, we use Zoom meetings in my office to get our sales meeting out to everybody, to get our manager's meetings out. And, and those things, a lot of people aren't using to run sales teams, but you say they're crucial. 100%. So 700 was seven, eight, 900 was right around the maximum amount of people that we had on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, but it went down as low as 100 uh, to 300 at some times, you know, so I would say our max was 700. But the way that you performance manage these people, uh, we use like Zoom conference calls. WhatsApp was very important because you can send voice messages. Uh, individual messages to them. So like if I had a sales rep that I wanted to motivate for that day, I could personally message them, you know, a 30 second WhatsApp audio while I'm driving to the meeting, you know, and I can hold them accountable, you know, and tie them down to their goals. So I think, I think that was very fulfilling for me because it's like, you know, you're going from, you know, understanding where I came from and then, taking some people that had never 
made over a thousand dollars in their in their in their in their in a week. Some people that had two three hundred dollars in their bank account at the time. Some people that I lent money to because they didn't have money to continue with the job that are now making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, um, with that high income and high reward and huge impact, you know, you were victimized by that corporate mindset, that, that, that big uncontrollable thing that comes along with corporate America. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talk to me a little bit about building all that to have it all taken away. Yeah. So, I haven't talked about this, and I'm glad, too. So, you know, I guess there's phases in everyone's life, and I would say, you know, one thing that I stress in selling is to maintain an even keel. You know, never allow your highs get too high or never allow your lows to get too low. And at this time, uh, Solar City was acquired by a much bigger company in Tesla, and when they were acquired, everyone was like, yes, we're Tesla now. We're going to go door to door as Tesla, <laughs> direct selling as Tesla. And then um, I remember I was on the way to the field to close the sale. And I had already basically had everything. Like for, I had already met with them. I was going to close it. And we were like, hey, we have a phone call in 30 minutes. And then five minutes before the call, I had gotten a call from my senior director who was like, hey, the guy that helped me that we built the East Coast with, and he's like, hey, they're firing everybody from direct sales. They're eliminating the channel. Oh, my God. And so we got on the call five minutes later. and uh, It's hard for me to fire two it, people, it five people. It was very quickly that they said, you know, we've decided to eliminate. You guys are no longer effective to go door to door at all. So I was like, can I even go to close the sale? And I'm like in the field, and they're like, "No, you, you, the guys are effective. Like this is it was the craziest thing that happened." Was there negativity that was causing the backlash, or no? It was just the fact that they were acquired by a bigger company, and Tesla and Elon Musk made the decision. Hey, we don't want door to door sales. We don't want direct sales representing Bad Tesla. Bad for our brand. Uh, whatever it was, it was it was the decision that was made, and then it was just like that. And how many people lost their jobs? Uh, there was, I mean. 2000 fuck 3000 probably that's i mean that's like probably a, that's pretty like a fucking atomic bomb yeah so 2000 3000 people right there hey you know we're going to eliminate the channel and i think you know a very minimal amount of people you know they they basically told us hey if you want to reapply for a job you can work inside of the home depot and it was we're direct sales people you know mm -hmm. we hunt what we kill we mm -hmm. want to dis decide our own wealth for that day mm -hmm. And the whole sales channel was cut just like that. Jesus. Yep. So um, now moving forward into 2020, um, what are your thoughts on the solar industry? I think the solar industry is alive and well. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people making. What are they talking about the subsidy winner? Yeah, I mean, people are making a. It's 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 all terms on your mindset. I know guys that are making over a million dollars as an individual sales rep. Oh, jeez. So it's like there's no like recession or like hey, like it's like when people are like I'm in a slump right now with selling. No, you're just in a bad mental state. There's no such thing as a slump in selling. Right. So it's like I think solar, unbelievable industry. You know, your decisions decide your wealth. Like, but you also have to realize it's very easy. What are the downsides of solar? I mean, the biggest problem with solar is if you're with a company that has bad operations yeah, or a bad company that's going to, you know, lie to you about things or like a lot of people don't talk about it, but it's called a bait and switch with a lot of companies in What's direct that? sales. In direct sales, a lot of companies will tell you one thing up front and they'll lie to you and then they'll switch things up after the deal was already made. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something like a common mispractice that hasn't been talked about. Yeah. Or like, for example, if you earn a certain amount of money and then, you know, you're owed X amount of money, they're like, hey, well, if you sign with us for the one more year, then we'll pay you that money. But if you don't, we're not paying you that money. That was already earned. When I was first year selling alarm systems, I was a rookie, but I sold 380 alarms at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. I looked at it. It was almost double. These are good ki Christian men. I mean, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to go into that. I don't know anything. <laughs> I'm not talking religion or politics here. Uh, but at the end of the year, I'd sold 380, and I was waiting on a 10 or a 15 or a 20% back-end check. And uh, 
it was for thirty eight thousand dollars that that I mean, they just told me, hey, we're not going to pay you. And it and and the company they said the company went under this and but it, it was money that was yeah. that was earned. You know, I went out and knocked those doors and I right. pr- produced that business. So it's like, you know, if you talk about you know, validity. And if you talk about like transparency, like this stuff doesn't get brought up in direct sales, but you know, the guys on the bottom, the guys that are out there grinding, if they go out and get that, you know, business for the company, why is the business shorting people? It's disgusting. You yeah. know, and you know, one thing about my business is we've stood behind every job we've ever done. You were talking about longevity before we got on this podcast. We've been doing insurance restoration since 1993. There's only getting hurricanes and hailstorms worse. You know what I mean? And our our industry is only getting even wider. There's more claims. There's more buildings out there getting damaged by storms. Um, you know, and that promise of standing behind every roof, that means that my company hasn't changed over all these years. It, it's transcended into, you know, standing behind every promise. Now, when you make a deal with somebody... You know, there's some things. Sometimes you don't get the deal clear up front. And when you don't get the deal clear up front, there's the, that's when there's a problem. You know, mm-hmm. in, in my history, you know, every single time that someone didn't align with my core values, couldn't keep up with the pack, and was sort of asked to leave, they've always had something bad to say. But essentially, you know, when in, my, in the roofing business, what we've struggled with is teaching people to do the whole job. Because that's what I always try and teach people to do. Because our profit's not made until the final check is collected. Mm-hmm. And so basically we have to you know, pay for 60% of our, our job as material and labor. And those, those, those jobs, whenever they don't get collected, no one gets paid. Mm-hmm. And so basically um, you see people come into my industry and want to get paid the largest commissions in direct sales, but they don't realize that the reason why we get paid that is because we're selling the whole time. Just like you're selling the whole time you're a caddy, you're selling the whole time that you're in the roofing business because if you do a shitty job on the last two holes caddying, you're not getting a tip. Of course. And it's the same same deal yes. as with doing the roof, and mm-hmm. it's a longer process. So, you know, we've been doing operations for a long time, 40,000 roofs or however many. Well, I think as sales professionals, you uh, like, so there's usually a rift, right? There's the sales side and then there's the operations. Mm-hmm. Sometimes there's like, oh, well, we're sales and we're operations. We tell you what to do. No, it's got to be a collaboration. Yeah. But at the same time, until you go to a company that doesn't operate the way that you expect them to, you know, then you start appreciating, understanding how important the operations is in direct sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, like if I go out and personally sell a lot of people, you know, I need two personal technicians. I need to have two personal technicians with me to keep up with me. You know, if I want to get the same day installs, if I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm doing eight today, not one install, one installer is not going to be able to do eight in a day. You know, you need two. So like, you know, I go to one house and, you know, that's what I always tell people. I mean, yeah. they, operations so important. They, they go to these companies and they're offering them more money or they're trying to say they're better. But the truth is, it's like if they don't build the jobs and nobody gets paid. Of course. And we've been doing this so long, you know, the proof is in the results and no one else in our space really gets results for other people or themselves like what we do. So, you know, that's why it's really, really important for us every year. You know, we buy our million dollar producers Rolexes, you know, they Every single week we, you know, are writing the big checks and sharing them out on social media. And those guys are the ones that are doing the job. And it's so funny. Out there, you make waves because the people that were with us in the beginning of the pack, they don't see themselves getting those checks, and it's my fault. Mm -hmm. You you know what I'm saying, right? Well, you look at direct sales, right? And you reason, like, hey, why is there so much mediocrity? Why is there so much turnover? Why aren't? sales reps at the same company for 10 plus years uh why aren't sales forces if you can teach somebody to make a million dollars a year why don't you have fifteen thousand sales reps right Mm -hmm. well why it's because it's because i think the reason there's so much mediocrity is because people don't understand all these different like ways to close transition break preoccupation so on and so forth but also they need to have the backbone or the vehicle of the company that's going to support them and be able to grow. 
And I think that's something very, very, very important in direct sales. Yeah. And so like my big picture is to have a company that sort of has multiple legs, you know, Mm -hmm. a, a, a roofing division, a solar division. And, you know, you even talked a little bit about the alarm industry. What do you love most about the alarm uh, industry? Alarm sales. So those are pretty fun. I think it's the highest paid commission that you can sell and install on the same day. Boom. So it's that's it's, why you love it. It's a handoff process. You know, there's not much follow up after this after. So it's just wham, bam. Thank you. It's man. a it's a raw boom in and out. <laughs> <laughs> However, it's not like, you know, you're a fly by night salesman, you know, right. these people are hugging you. Yeah, I'm taking pictures with them. They add me on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, they have my number if they ever need anything. Mm-hmm. But guess what, if I go in there and I completely delight them, mm-hmm. and I give them way more than they expect, and then the installer goes in, and the installation sucks, then what? They don't like you. Then it was no, all for I, nothing. I, That's how important ops is. Yeah. But Going back to like, you know, what's so fun about selling alarm systems is there is no callbacks. There's no like, hey, can you come back tomorrow? Like, no, this is a little bit different. Uh, Like I said, we did want to pay for maybe about two more. You probably know George and his wife, Tatiana, on the corner. So let me explain this to you again. There's Um, no callbacks. Yeah. So that I didn't any do any callbacks. Can I have your business card? Like, no, this is a little bit different. The only callback I would do is if it was a single wife at her home or a single husband, right? Mm-hmm. And th- this is like talking about like spousal objections, mm-hmm. like, oh, my wife or my husband isn't here. No, you take the process as far as you possibly can without being pushy. And then once you realize that sense, that instinct on if I keep pushing, I'm going to be pushy, You just set the appointment for as late as you can that night. Say, all right, I have another appointment at 8.30. And do you know where George Street is? Oh, yeah, that's the one right here. Okay, cool. So once I finish up with the Robinsons, I could actually come back over, like, after theirs. Would 9 o'clock be okay, or is that too late for you guys? No, that's good. Okay, cool. I'll stop by at 9. Now, this is at 3 p.m. during the day. What's that going to force me to do? It's going to force you to get another deal at the end of the day. It's going to force me to stay out there till 9 o'clock, and then the next person that I have that their husband or wife isn't home, I'm going to schedule their appointment for 845 or 830, 830, and then eight. So then it gets to the end and it's dark out. I've already got three deals on the board from finding people home. And now I'm meeting with these single wives that I've, I brought them as far through the process as possible. Mm -hmm. And I built the excitement as much as I could. So when their husband came home from work, that it's just, oh, hey, how's it going? Shake hands. Come on in. I'm going right to the kitchen table. It's a, it's a no-brainer that you have um, the opportunity to look at all these, like, different great sales. And I think, you know, you, in the door-to-door industry, you got somebody who says, oh, no, solar only, or oh, no, alarms only, or oh, no, roofing only. And everybody's hmm. afraid to lose their people. Everybody's afraid to lose their crowd. And so, um, you know, I have an idea to, to, to just bring a group of people together, get the best get the best training, get the best get the best people in a room and let them make their own decision. Mm -hmm. What what do you, what do you think about the roofing business? I mean, you were out for one day. What was it like? I mean, knocked one door, got one sale. And what, what walk me through that? So this is, uh, I had watched Lee knocked, knock two doors and I had watched them go to a call back with a woman where her husband wasn't there. And then we had knocked on one door, and the guy immediately slammed the door, and then we knocked on the neighbor's door, and their garage was open. So you had knocked the door, and I'm pretty sure Lee had gotten a phone call, so he had walked away. And I'd sat there for maybe 10 or 15 seconds, and I looked at the garage, and the garage is open. Still nobody answered, so I was like, somebody's home here. So I knocked the door, five, six knocks. I'm not a light knocker. You'll never hear me knock like that. That's the way I knock. In the garage? No, I knocked on the door, got them going. I knew the garage was open. I said, hello, hello, hello. Waited a little bit. Woman had walked to the door with small baby. Uh, very disarming when I talk with women. So I'm like, oh, hi, miss. How are you? Uh, sorry to bother you. I'm talking very low. Um, with my pitch because I want to come across as very disarming. And I simply told her, 
what I had heard you guys talking about. You know, if she had damage to her roof, you know, there's a possibility that it could be covered. There would be absolutely no way I could hurt her situation if I went through the process with her and she qualified that she would have the opportunity to have her roof covered. Now, keep in mind, I told her, I was like, I'm not telling you this is that I can do it. I, I It's almost like... Take in, it away. Al in, in alarms and selling solar, it's that's always a, that's like... That's a curiosity factor. It's Yes. So in alarms and selling solar, it's like, you know, hey, we go through a, a process. It's a series of seven questions. If we feel like you guys are a good fit for us, we'll show you a way that we completely custom fit the home. How many years have you even lived here? Oh, nice. Okay. Like I said, this is a little bit more selective. Um, but if you have lived here for seven years, uh, once I go through these questions, um, I kind of show you how it would work. It'll literally take about three minutes. Do you need me to take off my shoes? And nice. I'm going to transition into the home. So when I go back to that, you know, take away, you know, if I pick you, you know, we are paying for maybe about two more, uh, you know, sorry, I'm late, you know, different little one liners or tactics that I'm using in direct sales and that I'm using in my presentation. These are the things that made me better. These are the things that make me better. These quivers that I can have in my arrow. So like my the, the arrows I have, right? So it's like, I'm not interested, right? I hear people answer that all the time. And I'm like, there's better ways to answer it. But it, it, there's not just one way to answer it. So it's like, if you can learn all these different one-liners to add to your presentation, that when the customer objects or when the customer's concerns come out, guess what I'm hitting them with? I'm hitting them with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. J. Douglas Edwards, he's the godfather of sales. You can research from the 1950s. He's the one that taught Tom Hopkins. J. Douglas Edwards, Check he says out. that. We got, we got your master class. I've been doing some help with uh, Taylor um, as a vehicle for top talent. We're helping Taylor get his, his one-liners, the way he overcomes objections, his closes. And let me tell you, I endorse this guy as one of the best door-to-door -door guys, if not the very best that I've ever seen, met. And, and, you know, I swear, if you've been in the roofing business as long as me, you probably sold a lot more roofs. So my point is, is that um, we built this, this master class out and how to prepare your mind to manifest millions, how to use one-liners to overcome any objection, how to land your prospect the first with a one-call close, the fundamental skill of champion sales professional, how to use the can-we-pay question-based selling method. So let's go through. Let's go through a couple. Hit okay. me with. A, hit me. Hit me with. Like, let's give him a little. Let's give him a little like content, right? So okay. Like, I don't want it to just be like, you know, this is my second time doing a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. I don't do podcasts. Never right. have. But let's right. get into. The, let's get into the real stuff. Okay. So, like, so, let, so let's get, hit me with the not interested. I want to okay. give you a couple ways. So okay. Like, so so um, knock my door. All right. Um, what product? Uh, sell me an alarm, because yeah. All right. Cool. Hello, hello. Oh, hey, sir. Uh, sorry, I'm late. Uh, we did want to do about two more. Uh, you're the homeowner here, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, my name is Taylor McCarthy. Uh, we're just the ones with Brinks. Uh, and y whatever company you're using, you can use that. Um, so, like, if let, let's go into more of objections. That's what I want to do because I don't want to be one specific product mm -hmm. um, than okay. me going into my whole pitch right, or so presentation. So here's the deal. I don't care what it is you're selling. Yep. I'm not buying it. I'm not interested. Yeah, of course. You don't want to buy anything, right? No, I'm not buying. Yeah, this is completely different. Like I was saying, uh, we did want to pay for about two more. Do you know Judy? Uh, she lives across the road. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, like, we're not a charity. I'm not just sitting here saying we're going to completely custom fit the, your home. There's definitely going to be a few things we ask from you. Mm -hmm. uh, but bottom line, you're going to fall into one or two categories. You've already known about this because you've talked to people or it just sounds way too good to be true. Well, you want to know what the catch is, right? What's the catch? The catch is simple, sir. Like, you have to help us out by keeping the sign in the yard for the next five years for advertising. We're going to want to be able to use your name as a referencing to be able to create credibility. And then also... We're going to have you agree to a non-disclosure. If a neighbor asks you to say, hey, we're part of a special marketing program, we got a pretty good deal, you hold on to the brochure. If they ask you, you're just not going to show them your paperwork. You show them the brochure and say, i got a pretty good deal. Nice. All I do is I go through a series of seven questions. They're called can we pay questions. If we feel like you guys would be a good fit for us, we would actually show you a way that we would consider paying for it. All right. Well, let, me hear, let me hear about these questions. How many years have you guys lived here? 
Um, we're, we've been here for eight years. Eight years? Okay, cool. Uh, do you need me to take off my shoes? Sure. Okay, cool. And then I would go into transition into the home. And uh, I would build rapport at that time, and I would always start off with, hey, there's going to be a couple things we ask from you. So if you hand me the piece of paper, I'm going to go through this process with you. You can use this process in any sale, right? We could do the same closing transition in uh, solar. We can use the same transition in telecom. We could use the same transition in roofing. We could use the same transition in home improvement. We could use the same, uh, the same process in lawn care. So it's not just one specific industry. I like it. So this is a closing process using can we pay questions or the question-based selling process. Perfect. All right, sir. So you're pretty much what we call a shoe-in for this program. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, there's a few things that we want from you. The shoe's in my front porch. Yeah. Um, the first thing is we want to be able to use you as a reference because that will produce credibility for us. You got to do it. You got you to decide I want you. Yeah. Uh, secondly is the non-disclosure. If the neighbor asks you to say you're part of a special marketing program, and you have to keep the sign in the yard. Okay. Now, fair to say the main reason you've never had a security system in the home is because if I was sitting here asking you to pay $4,000 to buy it, you just this conversation would have ended five minutes ago. Yeah, no. If you had to come out of I'm pocket. I'm not spending money on a damn alarm system. Now, fair to say, hypothetically, if your house was broken into last night and there was an incident, I just randomly came up to the home and I was helping the other neighbors with their security systems, you'd at least take the information and consider paying the $4,000 for the peace of mind knowing the fact that somebody was in the home when they weren't supposed to. Yeah. Okay. So these questions that I go over will determine whether or not we feel as if you're a good fit for our program. Now, we're not a charity. We're going to ask you for those three things. Mm -hmm. But with quality control in mind, these questions will determine whether or not we pick your home. So the first thing we would start with is your main keypad, um, like kind of like being right here. We'd cover all the doors. You know, I'm not going to go just because I want to show you how the closing process works. But, you know, say I'd lay out a system for, you know, $4,200, you know, so on and so forth. I've tied you down to that first question indirectly that said the only reason that you would buy this system is if your house was broken into, right? Mm -hmm. So you already told me you wouldn't pay for it, but you would consider it if that happened. So mm -hmm. I'm going to use that to my benefit. The first question I have for you, sir, is definitely one of the most important questions. And I need you to be straightforward with me. What's that? Do you feel as if you're doing this? Like, And keep in mind, we're only paying for the homes that we feel like are a good fit. Do you feel like you're only doing this because we're completely paying for it? Like all the equipment? Or do you feel as if you're doing this because you're actually serious about protection of the home and family? No, I care about protecting my home and family, too, but it's a good deal. I, I, I mean, both. Okay, but would you be doing it more just because you're not paying for it? Yeah, or? more more because it's, yeah. You're going to hook me up? Hook me up. But it's more because of that than the serious protection of the home and family. Uh, no, the, the home and family is more important. Okay. I mean, a level with me, sir. I'm going to be straightforward with you. Like these are pretty easy to do. It's not like pulling teeth. If the only reason you're doing it is because we're paying for it, you're probably not going to use the system and we would never pick your home. If you're serious about the protection of the home and family, that's the reason that we would end up using the home. Okay. So I'll I'm ask, serious. I'll ask So you're very, you think you would use the system? Yeah, I would use it. Okay. So. Do you feel as if you'd use the system more when you're completely away from the home and the house is empty? Or do you feel as if you would use it at nighttime when you guys go to bed? Both. Both. Okay. Perfect. Now, keep in mind, I know the way he's going to answer these questions by the way that I'm asking them. They're, they're rhetorical. What would be a bigger concern for you? Somebody taking something from you or being in the home when they weren't supposed to? Um, someone taking something from me. So somebody taking something from you would be a bigger concern than somebody being in the home when they weren't supposed to. No, no. I like the uh, okay, nobody needs to be in both. Both. So and, and that's exactly why I have a system at home. It's more of a peace of mind thing for me. Mm -hmm. So like you guys don't have a garage here. When you pull the car out of the driveway, you have what's considered an open carport. So you pull away for the day. Somebody watches you leave. They go into the home when, they, when they're supposed to. And your home is completely vulnerable. It's your peace of mind that you're protecting as well. So how do you feel as if a system like this would provide you with peace of mind? Um, I think it would, I think it would hit, fit for sure. It would give me peace of mind. 
Perfect. How, how do you feel like it would provide you with peace of mind? More when you're away from the home or more like when both you're working? When both when I'm away from the home and, 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 and all that. Yeah. And I'm going to be straightforward with you, sir. This system isn't really for you. It's more for your wife and your kids. Mm -hmm. You can protect the home when you're here. But when you're gone, it's going to give you peace of mind and it's going to give them peace of mind. So you're, you're answering the questions very well. Uh, like I said, this kind of determines whether or not we're going to end up paying for this portion of the system. But one of my most important questions is, in the past five years, has there been a specific product or service that has led you to be vocal about your satisfaction? Meaning, do you feel as if you're the type of people? Oh, yeah, I got a roof, and the insurance company paid for it, and I referred him to, like, ten people. Really? Cool. Yeah. So the, next time, you go awesome in, the next time you go into a, a Walmart or a Best Buy, you're going to be required to go up to 13 people you don't know and actually tell them. About, no, I'm just kidding. Mm. I'm joking. Uh, I'm kidding, man. Uh, okay, so I want you to be familiar with how the system works. If the alarm goes off, it's going to audibly make a noise in the home. We're going to come through a speaker. We're going to ask you for a safe word. If your safe word's bananas, you say bananas, they know everything's cool. Now, hypothetically, if you're gone from the home, you're at church, you're at the supermarket, you're gone, the house is empty, Bill and Ted come into the home when they aren't supposed to, and... Uh, you know, we come through and we say, Lee, is everything okay? Lee, is everything okay? And nobody answers. You obviously want the police to show up, correct? Yeah. Okay. It's not going to be me that shows up on my backpack with on my bicycle to check if everything's okay. I know. We want the cops. That's the actual police. And we dispatch everything through the speaker. That's called monitoring. That's how the system operates. Mm -hmm. Now, you've answered every question exactly how we want. Like I said, you're pretty much what we call a shoe-in on the program. I do have one more question. It is a heavy question, but the company does require me to ask it. On a scale from 1 to 10, and if you had to break it down to decimal points, <coughs> if you had to break it down to decimal points, you definitely could. Um, uh, but what would you rate my socks? 10. 10. All right, cool. High five. Why would I do that? Psychologically, going back to salesmanship, why do you think I would do that? Why do you think I would do that? I don't know. I'm taking their buying resistance down. I've asked them certain questions at the end. In the past five years, has there been a specific product or service? I also tied you down to the monitoring because I asked you if you wanted the police to come. Right. And then I've lowered the buyer's resistance by making them laugh. Depending on my clientele at that point, I'll ask that question or the customers I serve. So you've answered the questions exactly how we like, sir. I'm going to show you how this works, and you tell me if you think it's fair. Okay. If I get through this process, it's a done deal. Firstly, is do you have any issue with us using your name as a reference? No. Nope. Secondly, is the non-disclosure if a neighbor asks, you say, hey, we're part of a special marketing program. You know, we got a pretty good deal. And lastly, is keeping that sign in the yard for the next three years. Right. If you're cool with those three things, just like I explained to you, and going back to that first question, the main reason you don't have a system is because you would never come out of pocket to buy it. We would cover that complete cost. We'd pay for the keypad, pay for the cell unit, pay for all the doors to be protected, pay for the doorbell camera, we pay for the camera in the back of the home. We pay for the thermostat. We pay for the maintenance. Um, typically, the way these things are installed is they're all done professionally. Mm -hmm. It is $200 to have these installed. The only way I know of you being exempt and not actually having to pay that $200 is if you're willing to be flexible, meaning like the next time they're out here with one of the neighbors, they would do yours back to back. So as long as you could be flexible, you don't even have to pay that 200 we would waive the fee to have it installed. So a cost that would be $4,200, you literally don't pay us now, you don't pay us never. Now where they get you is these systems dial out on a cell phone unit. It's wireless, like I was explaining to you. Kids can just cut the phone line and the system wouldn't dial out. That's typically what you're responsible for. And that's $89 every single month. That's monthly. Now, like I said, you're an advertising home. We're not gonna have you tell the neighbors but we're actually gonna pay that complete fee for you so the system will be able to dial out. The one and only thing we have no control over, like I explained to you, if the alarm goes off, it's not me showing up to your house with a bicycle. That's the actual police department that show, and we're responsible for dispatching everything through the speaker. We negotiated that to 14 bucks a week to make sure it was affordable for everybody. So most of the neighbors felt like it was pretty fair and cut and dry, we cover the entire cost of the system. Your only responsibility is to keep it connected to the police, fire, medical through dispatch. We would pay for the cost of the system. All I have to do is qualify the home. If they give me the thumbs up, then uh, we would move forward. 
just need you to fill this out. Name, address, zip phone, birthday. Boom, 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 boom. So um, there's no $4,000? No, we pay for that. Like I said, you're helping us out with being a reference. You guys aren't obviously going to tell the neighbors we paid for the entire system, and you keep the sign in the yard. So why not pay 4000 for my Vivint system? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm in. <laughs> Boom. No. So, but what did I, if you understand the psychology of what I did there, yeah. is I broke $56 or 60 bucks a month because I can add 4 bucks in taxes at the end of that. If you're selling at 50 bucks a month, then it's 12 bucks a week. But what am I doing there? I'm breaking it down to the ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I've built emotion in all these questions, and I've wrote down all the answers to your questions. Now, hypothetically, if I get through these questions, and I don't feel like you're 100% ready that when I drop the 14 bucks a week that you're 1,000% going to say yes, I hit them with this. Okay, you've answered the questions very well. Uh, the last part is our company does actually require you to write the three reasons why we should pick your home. Oh, nice. And Dude. I sit there, and I, 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 won't, I, I can't write it for you, I tell them. I say, our company requires you to write down the three reasons why we should pick your home. And I have them write because I'm on a fixed income. I've had them write because I'm scared. If you're doing that process in solar, you can have them write because my electricity bill keeps going up, because I want to do what's right for the environment. But when I have him writing it down now, I took that one step further from writing down all your answers to you writing down all the answers. So it's not what I say, it's, it's, it's not what I say, it's how I say it. It's not how I say it, it's how I make you feel. And in this situation, I'm building emotion from you writing that down. It's killer. It's, a, it's an absolute great sales process. So these are general sales tactics mm -hmm. that you can implement and apply to any industry. Um, but it, it's that, that connection with the customer to help them through the process. The sales process is not to the customer. The sales process is for the customer. A lot of the times you have to hold their hand and take them through the process. A lot of the times I have to be so repetitive. I say things six times and six times until they get the point. Like some people say, don't be repetitive. Like, you have to be repetitive because some things in one ear and out the other one. People don't, uh, people don't hear all the words that I'm saying. So we're about to get to creating this, this course. And as I go through it, uh, I'm pumped to see uh, the end result. And what's about to happen is a, is a, is a movement. We're, we're, we're creating an evolved influencer, one that's skilled up. And that can we pay method, I mean, we, we just went through a whole little example. I think we can cut a clip of this podcast and, and put and it keep right in mind, the course. Keep in mind, that's just, that's just one tactic. Like going back to what Jay Douglas Edwards says, the reason there's so many peons in the business of sales is because people only know one or two ways. So, like, I want you to do this, like, tell me you're not interested, and then once I handle the objection, I want you to tell me I'm not interested again, like, from a different person. I'm going to show you two different ways right now. Keep in mind, there's a bunch of ways, but there's, I think, two ways that are better than any way to handle not interested. Okay. Um, I'm not interested. <laughs> yeah, of course, sir. You don't want to buy anything, right? No, I don't want to buy anything. Okay, this I is, complete, want, this is completely different. Um, like I said, we did want to do about two more, and then I'm moving off of it. A lot of the times when you hear the first objection... I don't even address it because it's it's just smoke screen. Well, Ready? I really don't need it. Like, you don't understand. A lot of you guys have come through here and offered me solar, and I just don't. It's a, I'm not taking a $40,000 loan, This bro. is completely different. Okay. Keep in mind, we haven't picked your home yet. It's a little bit more selective. Um, but if I went through this process with you, you would do it. You weren't thinking about canceling your account with National Grid for your electricity, right? You guys weren't thinking about, like, buying a bunch of Yankee candles. I'm kidding. Obviously, you're not going to cancel your power bill. I definitely feel as if people hesitate to pay full price on things they don't need to. Uh, how long have you had National Grid? Or how long have you lived here? Uh, a few years. Okay. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm handling it, and then I'm moving on. All right? So a lot of the times, how many times people will tell you they're not interested within the first 15 seconds? Of Maybe you knocked a door. How many times have you knocked a door within the first 10 seconds? You haven't even told them what you're there for. They told you you're not interested. A ton. Yeah. Okay. We had one the other day. The guy didn't yeah. even let me have five okay. seconds. So hit me with that situation. First five seconds, he says. Look, look, look. No, thank you. No. Yeah. Bye. Sir, Bye, actually, dude. Bye. 
Yeah, yeah, you're not. There's actually no way you could be interested. Did you even know what? Uh, did you guys know what happened last Tuesday? Look, man, I don't give a fuck what happened. Get the fuck off my porch. Yeah, there's no way you could be interested though. Like you said, you're not interested, but how could you be? I didn't explain to you why I was here. I know, the but incident... I'm so sick of you peddlers, you roofing fucking peddlers. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not here doing a roof, sir. This is completely different. What did are you, you doing? know about what happened? What happened? Okay, sir. So, <laughs> I'm not trying to be rude, but like you told me you aren't interested, and I'm trying to explain to you why I'm here. Um, this is what's going on. Um, we're dealing with an incident that happened. Um, now, keep in mind, we're not trying to come down on anybody. However, it is important. Uh, you guys have an issue, and then I would go into it, whether it's a roof, whether it's solar, or whether it's alarm. What I'm getting at is when somebody says not interested within the first five seconds, I'm not interested. Of course, sir. There's no actually possible way you could be interested. Like, I haven't even explained to you. Now, the hardest part of my job is timing. And I understand if it's a bad time right now, um, but the reason I'm here is a little bit different. I like that. The hardest part of my job is timing. I love that. I heard yeah, you say that out the there. The hardest part of my job is timing. All I'm trying to do is set up a time when you have time. Okay, so I'm just step one. This this isn't. I'm I'm not a. You know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not gonna make ask you to make any decision. Like I said, I'm just step one. Um, but at the same time, this isn't like pulling teeth. These are very easy to do. It's that conviction that is going to get people through the finish line. So um, you heard it. This man knows what he's talking about. And, you know, I am um, pretty pumped, man, pretty pumped to get into uh, the future of, of the movement. And what I mean by that is I really believe that there is a way that alarm guys can, can, can refer deals to roofers, that solar guys could, can partner with the roofer. I believe every solar guy should have a roofing division. Every roofing guy should have a solar division. Mm -hmm. And... You know, here we are with this crossroads where you know digital marketing is starting to make an impact on 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 the entire industry for recruiting, lead generation, branding in the neighborhood while you knock doors, and you know I just I just finished a book, this book it talks about digital door knocking and last last week right before you got here we shot a course with Danny Pessy, and Stud. yeah and 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 I was I actually set up a recruiting funnel for him while he sat here, so. Um, I just can't wait to see what happens when all the worlds come together. What do you think it looks like? I, you know, at, at first, I think the typical stereotype, people think of digital marketing and they're like, oh, internet marketing, you know, this or that. And I was pretty reluctant to even, this is my second podcast, I was reluctant to, you know, put out a sales course. But it's like, I think when when it, you're doing a disservice to other people if you don't help the next generation, you know, it's kind of like, you know, Kobe Bryant, right? He mm -hmm. talks about helping that next generation. I'm a Celtics fan, so, you know, rest in peace, Kobe. But uh, you looked at his mentality on things and how he treated that next generation. And I think that going back to my roots and those humble beginnings and understanding the value of a dollar and watching my dad struggle and saying, hey, there's thousands, thousands of those people that we can change their life. Yeah, and so we don't want to limit anybody. Like I, I, I know that I am destined to be the best facilitator of success as a blue collar entrepreneur, and that encircles all the industries, you know. And like you said, home improvement, roofing, solar, security, pest, and there's a movement that's about to happen. And all I care about is being the best at bringing people in and making them successful. Because, yeah. you know, it's not just the money. But it's it's the part about us being in a sport, us being able to train like Kobe, having, you know, to take shots. You know, it's like he said, you know, don't rest in the middle, rest at the end. You know, we're, we're young bucks in this game. Mm -hmm. You know, Grant Cardone called you and invited you to that episode of Power Players. So yes. I, what was that call like? So Cause, that was Because he didn't call me. I, I had to pay for my episode. How, how did that go down? Yeah, so on, honest, honest to God, he called me. It was the end of my third year of selling alarms. I just smashed everyone for the third year in my company. And, uh, you know, I say that and I, I understand, like, you know, be be humble. Like, it's good to be humble at home, but, like, it's also good to have self-talk and look at yourself like a prize I fighter. I smashed everybody. You got to look at yourself like a prize fighter. You got to look at yeah. yourself like the best, Yeah. you know, in, in the sense of where you want to be and self-talk yourself to where you want to be. But he had given me a call, said, you're a big 10 Xer, uh, and... I want you to come down to Miami for my show, Power Players. When can you come? And I remember it was just after my 25th birthday. I just turned 25, so really called me when I was 24 years old. 
and uh, at that time was the first time I met him, went down there, and from that, it had led me to uh, Tom Hopkins as well, and I had actually, you know, consider Tom a very good friend of mine now. He gives I, the best sales training out there, huh? It's, uh, in my opinion, if you want meat and potatoes and you want to learn these things that will make you better, for me, that's what it was because it was specific things. Like, Well, you learned on the streets. You learned from Grant. Yep. You learned from Tom. You learned from, you learned from everybody, right. 100%. And, and, and I, I'll tell you, I, Jordan Belfort and his system has influenced me, but it's just a yep. part of it. I learned a lot from Grant. I've knocked 50,000 doors. Gotta, you've got to be a lifetime learner, right? You know? you're, you're either getting better or you're worse. There's I'll tell no you who, who taught me the digital door knocking, and that's Russell Brunson. And oh, yeah. his, his information is a combination of all the previous internet marketers. And so, you know, guys, legends like Dan Sullivan, uh, and, and Frank Kern, and, and they influenced before Russell Brunson, and now applying the two worlds, there's no one else doing it like, like th th that, we, that we have here. That's the modern sales system for a contractor, modern sales system for a door-to-door -door recruiter. And, um, you know, I, I know that the future is vast. I know that even in times of recession, that in our business – we 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 get we can switch and go chase storms in when when it's great for solar and everything else we can switch and sell solar and you know when the zombie apocalypse has happened they're gonna need more damn alarms mm -hmm. and you know the truth is is that well I think a good thing like when when people talk there's like a fine line where it's like hey I want to sell every product under the sun and then they're not effective and then also the ability to only limit yourself to one thing so. One of my favorite lines in business is the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Sounds very simple. But at the same time, you have to recognize where your cash cow is, and then you need to delegate. Let me explain how that works for me. The main thing is roofing. Yep. I have you here to create a course so that we can impact more people in another space to get them into roofing while getting you into roofing mm -hmm. while we end up getting ourselves into some other things like solar and possibly alarms. Yes. And so I'll put the sweat equity, whether it takes one week building this course just so that you can see – what type of vehicle that we have here? It's a hybrid vehicle, a vehicle that you know includes digital marketing, inside sales, door to door, but also basically um, unlimited uh, large commissions, unlimited impact, and potential for big time reoccurring revenue. So I'm reading a book, and this it's about the business of platforms. Yeah. And what is a platform? Platforms like. A disruption. It's a Uber. It's one thing a, it's a I see, one thing I see you're good at, and this is how you do that. I think is you delegate your authority, but you never delegate your responsibility. But delegation is one of the five D's of selling, and that's very important if you look at it. Delegation, delegating your authority, but never your responsibility. So making sure you're responsible of things, but people like to be. You know, hey, I need you to be, you know, spearheading this. Well, to be a content curator and to mm -hmm. curate and, and make the biggest impact that I need to make, I, I have to find a door-to-door -door general, a, a guy that can lead the charge. And the main thing, the main thing, the roofing, mm -hmm. that's that's always going to be the biggest ticket. And it's and there's always going to be a market for it. Everybody needs a roof. There's always going to be storms. But, but – why am I not doing solar? Why would that not double my sales? And why don't I have a way to have a product that we can get a door-to-door -door rep in the door where they can sell, install, and get paid on the first day? And having a trifecta and having also uh, a, 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 a group of contractors that yeah. we're helping, that we're, that we're helping grow, that, we're, that, are, that are making bigger impact, proofs that our system works. That that to me is where it gets exciting about the collaboration. So yeah, me too, man. Me man, too. I tell you, dude, it's been an awesome podcast. The first, and, and you're, you're gonna have to come back here, bro. It's, yeah, this, no, it's this, cool. This it's one cool was fun. To, uh, it's cool to be here and uh, try to bring as much value as I can. So, um, where can these guys find you on Instagram? How can they get a hold of you? Uh, Taylor McSolar, Taylor M C C Solar, Taylor McCarthy LinkedIn, uh, Taylor McCarthy Facebook, and. Uh, the big thing I'm working on is this uh, sales system. And I just gave you guys a little taste of it. But going back to what Jay Douglas says, the reason there's so many peons and mediocrity in the business is because 
you only know one or two ways to transition or break preoccupation or to close. And when you know 30 different ways to close or 30 different ways to transition or 30 different ways to handle I'm not interested or different ways to handle I want to think about it, like these are the real things that are going to happen in the field. So I bring in Taylor as a door-to-door consultant for me, and essentially I'm going to try and you know put him in charge of all the troops, in charge of all the mission, and see if he can take this. And I'm willing to give up, you know what what some would consider uh, a small fortune because you don't want to play this game after yeah. after making a million dollars. You don't want to play this game unless you can make a million dollars. Of course. And the vehicle that you get into, if you don't have a chance of making a million dollars, then you don't want to get out of bed. Mm-hmm. And really, it's more like two because you already made a million. Yeah, so you and, need the opportunity and to make two million. You look at the million. point, you know, understanding what had happened. Absolutely. Now, you don't do it for the money, though, yeah. do you? Do you do it for, for the me? Money? No, I, I, I believe in winning. But are you money driven? How, how do you? How, what's the difference between money the two? was never really important to me. I needed it, but I never looked at my paychecks. I would get the paycheck, and it would go in my glo- glove compartment in my car, and I had like thirteen of them, and then I'd cash them. It wasn't it wasn't like that for me. It wasn't like I'd cash my check. I mean, this is when I started making my money, and you know I've been pretty good with my money. But for me, it was always about winning. It was looking at the scoreboards. It was looking at the scoreboard. If you ignore the numbers, the numbers will ignore you. Look, if you watch the numbers, you know you'll get to. Marcus Lamona says you cannot be a great businessman if you don't know the numbers. And the numbers in roofing sales or just about any of these sales, you talk to twenty people, you're gonna get one deal. And to talk to twenty people, you may have to knock yeah. on fifty doors. But it's also having that absolute certainty. Are you going out there to knock doors? Or are you going out there to sell? Like I never went out there to work for free. I knew I was going to sell. Usually, the first person I talked to, which I proved to you yesterday, right. is a sale. And most of it's energy. Most of it's the ability to manifest your future. So we're going to put that all on tape. We're about to make this masterclass, Taylor McCarthy's sales system of an evolved influencer. And so, um, you know, this has been a great podcast. We're, I don't know to leave the whole episode up, cut little pieces of it out, use some of it for the training course. But I hope this. you all enjoyed it. Comment below if you enjoyed it subscribe you're going to be seeing more of me and taylor in the field we're going to be selling roofing we're going to be selling solar we're going to be selling alarms and uh danny pessy he's yeah. he, we just did I a think course we with only him. gave them about this much so yeah. there's a lot more there's a lot more that it's kind of like you know collaboration you know we collaborate and you know i say you collab- only try to help as I much say, people as i we say can. collaborate to dominate but but just think about what industries are gonna are gonna are gonna shake whenever me you and danny are are disrupting the business and then that, that's like pulling together uh, a golden state team you know a couple power players yeah yep. and and so you know we got some power players inside of my organization already but you know w- what you're always having to do to get to that next step is you got to be willing to kill the old version of you and the yes. old version of me was him it was it was me in charge of the team in the sales management the best salesperson the sales leader and you know in order for me to get to the next step i have to be that uh chief uh brand and movement pusher which is a different whole different thing yeah because that affects all the things and so that means i have to relinquish uh what is honest honestly the highest paying part of what I, what i do but I have to pay someone else to do it because I, I love this more. Yeah, no, and it's 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 funny you say this, and I'm going to kind of leave this out there for you guys listening. You're all going to have your ups and downs, right? Like, you're going to always, your highs are going to get hot too high, your lows are going to get too low. I say stay even-keeled. But throughout the process, right, whether you're making 20000 40000 a million dollars, and then you get to a high point and then you go to a low point, you are at a high point right now. The best revenge is massive success. Having absolute certainty on your mission and no one can tell you anything else. It's called being myopic, just like this, a tunnel vision. I know what I need to do. You said you made $7 million. How, how much did you say you made on, on Door to Door? I think I calculated it to like a little under $8 million since I started in Door to Door at 18. Wow. So that's and you just turned 30 years 13 old. 13 years. I just turned 30 in 13 years. So I averaged everything out. Let me tell you, all you got to have is the will to win and anything's possible for you. So you just need to get information from real people. There's a lot of people out here that, that has been, didn't make it. And 
there's an epidemic of misinformation. Yeah, out the there. biggest thing, like when you meet someone, like I always ask them, like you know, like it, sometimes it's too direct, but like, hey, can I see a bank account? <laughs> right. Can I see your bank account, or can I see stats of you being number one? Like, or can I see the trophies? Because the one thing that a lot of people say is like, oh, I'm the number one sales rep in this or that. Like, well, okay, what did you get the trophy at the end of the year? How many years were you that position? You know, what was going on? You know, and it's called validity. Right? Yeah, that's what it's, it's validity. called. Validity. And uh, and uh, the problem with fake gurus is a lot of people are learning fake information and paying for stuff or whatnot that they don't, you know, might get a little value out of. But they pay for information they already know, and it's one of the biggest fears. It's, yes. It makes them feel like a jackass. Yeah, and, and at the same time, if you do go through a process and you're like, all right, I'm going to fully commit to this, I'm going to fully commit to this, and then you start learning these and writing these lines down word for word, it's going to make a huge difference, you know? Understanding how, uh, you know, I want to think about it, I had to formulate a way to handle I want to think about it and I need to formulate it so perfect that I had to write it down word for word. And then I needed a PDR, practice, drill, rehearse. And now I know that like the back of my hand, that if somebody says I want to think about it, I know how to handle that in a certain way. You know, So there's different ways to handle everything, but constantly improve. You're either getting better or worse. There's no neutral in the game. All right, guys. I think we're going to do a follow-up episode, but that was excellent. Y'all comment below if you learned anything. Subscribe for more. We really appreciate you. Till the next time in the Blue Collar Boardroom. Peace out.